Take a listen to this new interview from Tom Lee on CNBC today. So it was, of course, a volatile month with the Dow, S&P and Nasdaq carving out gains uh, with the Dow and S&P hovering at fresh highs. Uh, so what will September bring for stocks as we get ready for a jobs report and possible Fed rate cuts? Joining us now, Fundstrack Global Advisors, Head of Research and CNBC contributor Tom Lee. Tom, great to have you with us. Nasdaq, I should clarify, will only have gains if it uh, continues its strong session uh, today, so it won't be significant net gains. Tom, um, great to see you. Long time no speak. First and yeah. foremost, what's what's your mark, your reaction to how the market is processed NVIDIA's numbers? It, uh, of course, fell initially in the pre-market. Yesterday morning it was doing all right, and then it did, did close uh, more meaningfully down by the end of the session yesterday. Well, I, I think NVIDIA is one of these stocks that has become part of like uh, a stock market lore. Almost everyone has a position. And I don't think the results and the earnings changed anyone's minds about AI and the central role it's playing in, in both global productivity, but also NVIDIA's role. But it, I think the sell-off tells you that a lot of good news was priced in. I think that's why uh, the stock fell. It didn't take the broader market down. I think that was kind of a, a positive uh, outcome. And I think it just shows you that there's room for a lot of rotation, and, and I think that it's revealing that small caps is one of the groups benefiting from that rotation. Let's talk about that rotation, Tom, and the extent to which there's still a long way to go if you're looking at the valuations of some of those sectors that haven't done so well in recent months uh, and years, or, or whether things have bounced enough across the board that you start to get a little bit concerned about valuations for the entire market, not just the NVIDIAs of this world. Um, well, yeah, valuations are definitely something our clients are asking us about because, uh, you know, the equity markets have been rising for several years. But the idea of a rotation, I, I think, is grounded on a couple of things. One is that the Fed's rate path is lower and that benefits cyclical stocks and small caps. And we know there's also a lot of cash on the sidelines and investors de-risk uh, because of you know the the yen crisis and, and just general concerns about the summer, and so I, I think the Nvidia uh, results plus the Fed in September is really the catalyst that it's going to get some investors to actually follow through with the rotation. So I think we're early because, for instance, small caps. I know people think they're expensive, but the median PE of a Russell 2000 stock is still 10.7 times forward earnings. That's compared to almost 17 times for the S&P. So the, the small caps have a lot of room for multiple expansion. But uh, yeah. Tom, do you want to just own the index? I mean, a lot, there's a lot of not great companies when you talk about small caps, you know, in terms of just not just their indebtedness, but any number of other metrics you might want to use. Are you telling people they should buy individual stocks or just buy the, uh, the index? Uh, I, I think it's both, David. I, you know, we have a lot of... Uh, portfolio managers that actually focus on small caps and, they, and they're finding a lot of really attractive individual ideas with good earnings growth. But I think there is a misconception about the Russell 2000. I, I know there's many non-earners, but over 70% of the non-earners in the Russell 2000 are biotech stocks. And I don't think they're meant to generate earnings. And if you look at Russell 2000 earnings in aggregate, it, it rose 30 or 18% of the quarter and it's projected to grow 39% in the third quarter. So in aggregate, it's not a bad index to own anyways. Tom, I wanted to get your thoughts on the broader economic data. This morning, PCE came in, in line with expectations. We had GDP yesterday at 3% versus the 2.8% estimate. As we start to get ready for an interest rate cut, how much is already priced into this market? Uh, we, we'll never know how much good news is priced in, but I think there was a lot of encouragement in both of the data points you point out. You know. PCE core came in at 0.16. You know, the upside driver there was actually financial services, which is because the stock market's up. It's showing up as inflation in PCE core. The year over year is staying at 2.5, 2.6, which means most people were thinking that year over year would actually tick up. They had negative revisions for the prior months. And on the inflation side, you know, the, the, a 2.8 for UMICH one year, uh, that's pre-pandemic levels of inflation. Consumers are always around 2.8. So I, I think this is giving the Fed a lot more green light to cut and focus on keeping the labor market strong, which means it's essentially acting as a Fed put going forward. Now, I have to say, I agree with basically everything Tom Lee said there, even including today. The economic data came in 
as good as you could possibly expect it would. And I do think we're actually setting up for what could be a sweet spot in markets, potentially in the month of September, which is strange because September is historically over the past 10 years, the worst month by far for stocks. On average, there's only a 30% win ratio for September for the S&P over the past 10 years. So that means only 30% of the time the S&P is actually in the green in September, by far the worst month. And you'll probably be even more surprised to learn since 2020, the best September we had was negative 4.1% for the S&P. And that was in 2020. In 2021, you were down 5.0%. In 2022, you were down 9.6%. And in 2023, you were down 5.1%. That brings your 10-year average return in September to negative 2.6%. So even though we have these negative seasonal headwinds in September, I actually think September could be a great month for equities. Perhaps not a super stellar month for the S&P 500, and that's where I agree with Tom Lee here. I think dividend, value, cyclical, interest rate sensitive stocks are going to be the real leaders in September. Because let's face it, the only thing that matters is economic activity. If the Fed is cutting into weakness, or cutting into strength or a decent economy. That's the only thing that matters to markets. And I'm not super concerned about the economic data that we are going to get in September. Now, my concerns will grow in October, especially November and December, just because I think the data is very lagged behind. So the data we're getting in September is data for July. But I really think this could be representing what we were seeing in the economy in May and June. So I think the data we're getting now is so lagged behind. Yes, the economy has weakened in recent months, but we're not being reflected that just yet. And this is a theory that I've had for a little while now. And the reason why I ultimately think September is going to be a good month for stocks. And this was further validated today. Core PCE price index month over month came in at 0.2% but it actually came in better than that. As Nick Timmerhaus writes on X, as expected, another cool inflation reading for July. The core PCE index rose 0.16% in July from June. So it comes off as 0.2% because it gets rounded for the headlines. 12 month core PCE is 2.6%, six month annualized is 2.6%, and three month annualized is 1.7%. So that means if you take the last three months of month over month core PCE and just times that by 12, you're going to be at 1.7% if this pace of inflation continues for 12 months or another nine months. You could actually be below the Fed's target of 2%, nine months from now, if it continues at this pace, you're going to be below that target, um, you know, lower than even 1.7% if inflation continues to come in even lower. You could get there in four or five, six months if we start to come in at like 0.10%. So in fact, this is going to sound crazy. We may start worrying about deflation if in the coming months inflation just continues to decelerate, which deflation is actually worse than inflation, but we're long from actually crossing that that bridge where the markets would start to be concerned about that. So that was the first bit of data today, but not the most important data. The most important data of the day today was personal income month over month and personal spending month over month, in which personal income month over month came in at 0.3%. We were expecting 0.2%. So personal income coming in better than expected was exactly what you wanted to see because consumers feel stretched. They haven't been keeping up with inflation as, as far as their wages. And Jerome Powell said at Jackson Hole and in the last couple of press conferences that they're not worried about a wage price spiral. They're not worried about, you know, higher incomes boosting inflationary pressures. So people making more means people can spend more. And as far as being an investor in our markets, that's great news. Personal spending month over month came in at 0.5%. The estimate was also 0.5%. So personal spending was good. 
income came in higher than expected, and PCE came in good, below estimates slightly. That's all good news. You also had Michigan Consumer Sentiment, final numbers for August that came out this morning. Um, they came in at 67.9. We were actually expecting 68, so a little bit better. Um, so it did come in one tenth of one point worse, but not a big deal. Last the the last numbers that we had were 66.4. So it did come in um, higher, quite a bit higher, 1.5 points higher than last. Um, the last number we got five-year inflation expectations stayed steady at 3%. Michigan consumer expectations came in at 72.1. Um, the last number we had was 68.8. This actually came in right in line with the number that we were expecting. Michigan current conditions came in at 61.3. That is down from the last estimate we had of 62.7, but up from the expected 60.9. This is pretty concerning, I think. Um, it just continues to get worse. Michigan current economic conditions is just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But Wall Street doesn't care about this one data point that much. And then one year inflation expectations came in at 2.8%. That was lower than the 2.9%, which was expected and the lowest you have been at in over a year. You also had Chicago PMIs that came in at 46.1. We were expecting 45.5. So that was better than expected as well. So literally across the board, the data came in good for markets today. Now, I think the attention is really on the payrolls report coming out next week. And that's going to be the next big catalyst for markets. Again, good news is good news. Bad news is bad news. So if that report comes in good, comes in on the higher side, markets are going to love that. You're going to have a great day. If it comes in line with estimates, markets are going to love that as long as it's good, right? If it comes in bad, markets are going to absolutely hate that. They're going to throw up all over you like a newborn baby. So I guess this was all the good news. In the near term, I'm not concerned about markets. September is probably going to be a good month, whereas historically in the past decade or so, it has been the worst month for stocks. Okay, that's that's good news. Um, I think heading into September 18th and likely after that, there's going to be a lot of reasons to be bullish. And I think small caps are going to do well. I think value, dividends, cyclicals, all of that. And there's a lot of people actually calling for a soft landing and, and, and convinced that we've already achieved a soft landing, including Jim Bullard, which was the Fed official for the St. Louis Fed in 2022 that would spook the markets every time he talked. This guy would talk about 6 to 7% federal funds rates, deep recessions, and you would have 2, 3, 4% red days pretty regularly based on Jim Bullard. And he just said, we've achieved a, achieved a soft landing. Take a listen to this clip briefly. We view the latest inflation data. Former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. He is now the Dean of Purdue University's Mitchell E. Daniels School of Business. Great to have you, Jim. Thank you for being here. Uh, I first want to get your take on today's PCE data and whether it signals to you that uh, we have mission accomplished on inflation. Uh, this was a good report, right on track with what markets were expecting. Uh, this will put the Fed uh, squarely on uh, rate cut uh, in September. And I think it's going to be 25 basis points. And I think the debate now will shift out to uh, the, the November-December meeting. And I think the baseline there is 25 basis points at each of those meetings as well. And uh, it is a soft landing, and it's, I think it has been achieved. I think Jay's, uh, Jay Powell's speech at uh, Jackson Hole was essentially recapping uh, the success of monetary policy over the last two years. So soft landing, it sounds like you're still expecting a, a gradual cutting of, weight, of rates, 25 basis points, maybe some debate uh, thereafter. What are you looking for in next week's payrolls report that could change that dynamic for you? Yeah, I think this is, uh, I think the debate, because of Jackson Hole, I think the debate's shifting. So now if you got a surprise in any of the upcoming reports, I don't think it would affect September. It would affect the debate about what to do later this year and uh, focus on November. So for instance, if the payrolls report was uh, very hot and showed a, a thriving uh, jobs market, that might call November into question. 
uh, about whether the committee would do anything there. Uh, if it was a very weak report, uh, let's say, you know, close to zero or something, uh, then you might get a uh, debate about whether they need to do more. But I think the, the do more would be farther out in the future, not at the September meeting, because I think they would just shrug off uh, any data that's coming in now between now and the meeting as uh, as just one data point and, and they wouldn't probably react to that. OK, now the bad news is by the end of this year, I don't think the markets are going to be in a great place. And especially into Q1, Q2 of 2025, we're going to be knocking on the doorstep, if not through the doorway of a recession. The research that I'm doing on the ground, mainly talking to people, doing small surveys, um, getting to know different demographics of, of income earners, the economy is dramatically worsening because people are dramatically slowing down the amount of money that they are spending. And this will eventually get reflected in economic data. Now, I want you guys to think about the income earners of this country. You have the lower in income earners. You have middle class if we can call you know a, a middle class a middle class anymore and then you have the higher end earners theoretically the the lower class of earners would get affected first middle income earners next and then higher income earners well as you know yesterday dollar general had its worst day on record in the history of the company and the stock fell 32 percent now i want to share this of the the transcript of the conference call with you because dollar general specifically caters to the lower income consumer and they provide a lot of context here they say as well as our continued softness in discretionary sales and our own customer data and survey work we believe the softer than a then anticipated sales performance in q2 is at least partially attributable to a core consumer uh, customer that is less confident of their financial position. I want to provide some additional context around what we're seeing and hearing from our customers. The majority of them state that they feel worse off financially than they were six months ago as higher prices, softer employment levels, and increased borrowing costs have negatively impacted low-income consumer sentiment. As a result, our core customer, who contributes approximately 60% of our overall sales, comes predominantly from households earning less than $35,000 annually. So there is no better company to tell you how the lower end consumer is doing. Okay. And again, when you have this kind of weakness in the low end consumer, that will get reflected in economic data. The problem is not recession, no recession in terms of markets or being an investor, right? The problem is the S&P, the NASDAQ, these, these, these indexes are pricing in a 0% chance of a recession. That is incorrect that is false there will be there will be a time where markets will be forced to price in more recession risk and stocks will fall but they go on to say inflation has contributed negatively um, uh, to impact these households with more than 60 percent claiming they've had to sacrifice on purchasing basic necessities due to the higher cost of those items so people are skipping basic necessities 60 percent of them because they're just too expensive in addition to paying more for expenses such as rent, utilities, and health care. More of our customers report that they are now resorting to using credit cards for basic household needs, and approximately 30% have at least one credit card that has reached its limit. And in our latest survey, 25% of our customers surveyed noted they anticipated missing a bill payment in the next six months. Ouch! Okay, that is not good. And it will get reflected in economic data at some point in the coming months. And this is really adding to some of the in-person, you know, online research that I've been doing um, around the middle class, right? I think that's important for, do we go into a recession? Do we not? Okay. Um, the lower income earners, you know, feeling doing this bad, that's going to affect economic data but may not be enough to push us into a full-blown recession you need the middle class to also start to falter and that's where i'm starting to see a lot of the faltering take place low income earners yeah they're up shit's creek already but the middle income earners they're starting to paddle up shit's creek as well
And I do think this holiday season is really going to start pushing those people over the edge. And that's why I think towards the end of this year, really Q1, Q2 of 2025, markets as a whole are going to be pretty far up Shit's Creek. But again, I do think markets can rally in the near term. I do think a broadening out of our markets makes sense. And I think there's more working for us in the near term than not. But don't be confused. It's not going to be this good forever. So let me know what you think about all of this information down below in the comment section. Hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. You guys have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next one.